Hi everybody, this is Jonathan Schrantz, and today I wanted to go over a few games from uh, one of the, the greatest romantic players that I think a lot of people still haven't heard of, and that's Joseph Henry, the Black Death Blackburn. Uh, he's one of the, the most amazing, brilliant chess players that ever lived. A lot of people overlook him, you know, they think of people like Paul Morphy when they think back on the romantic era. Blackburn was actually inspired quite a bit by Morphy and started playing chess because of Morphy. So a lot of his games have the same style. It's really aggressive stuff. It's attacking chess. It's a lot of gambits. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. And I do want to spend a little bit of time today. I'm going to show you guys three games that he played. Absolutely crushing, brilliant attacks. It's going to be some good games for a whole range of players. Obviously, if you're a beginner, it's going to be good to know these model attacks. And uh, if you've been around and you're experienced, it's still always fun. They're very enjoyable games. Real brilliant stuff, and uh, I do want to have a look here at some of his best games. And this first game I'm going to show you was just a casual game that he played. A lot of the games that he played that were brilliant were blindfold games, simul games. But this one, as I understand it, was just a casual game. And uh, the, the opening here was a very interesting one. If you guys do want to check out any of these openings, I will put a link in the description below. So there'll be a link to the study if you guys want to go and analyze some of these games for yourself. Uh, obviously, this is from a, a different era, the era before computers. So a little bit of this might be unsound, but definitely a lot of fun to check out and to watch. So here, we get a typical Gioco piano, maybe? Well, no! Well, no, White uh, has decided here to play the Jerome Gambit, also known as the Kentucky Gambit or the Kentucky Opening. And uh, this one has been pretty popular these days. A lot of people have started playing it. Not sound, <laughs> probably not the, uh, the right opening, but definitely a lot of fun. And White can potentially get a huge attack here, so Black has to be very careful. In the game, he took back, and White's amazing point here is Knight takes e5. So all these crazy gambits, you know, they were very popular back then. This one is starting to make a, a little resurgence here. And after they take, white very quickly brings in the queen with check. Blackburn has the black pieces here, though, and uh, he's got to find a move. I think a lot of people now play all sorts of different things here. Uh, the two main moves, theoretically, being kind of these, these king moves. Uh, but he plays a very interesting move here, this move pawn to g6. So offering the knight again. You know, not trying to be too greedy. And here he plays a very fascinating move. I think, theoretically, if black wants to just be lame, queen to e7 is a very great move in this position. Um, but what he played in the game was pawn to d6. And I will leave his annotations to the game. He actually annotated quite a lot of his own games. So I will, uh, in the study, you'll be able to see his own annotations. A lot of them are pretty funny and pretty clever. Here, after d6, he said not to be outdone in generosity. So he's uh, offering that rook on h8, which obviously Black was delighted to just gobble on up. And his whole point now is to go on the attack. So a lot of these games, especially from the Romantic era, they're going to be characterized by one side, getting all the pieces out as quickly as possible. The other side, being kind of greedy, not wanting to uh, to lose any of their pieces or anything. So here, queen to h4 is the start of this attack. It obviously attacks that f-pawn, so you know black is threatening uh, to take right here on f2. And after castles protecting it, knight to f6 is the point. And black is about to have a very beautiful attack here. There's this kind of typical combination in a lot of these attacks when there's no knight on f3 and there's not a lot of pieces surrounding the castled king. When you have a queen, a knight, and a bishop, they often can combine very well to create a fantastic attack. For example, knight g4 is just the simple threat and black will be putting too much pressure on the h and f pawns for white to deal with it. Now, this technically is unsound by black, but only if you guys can find the one move for white, which wasn't played in the game, that actually might be able to defend here. So you may want to pause and just take a take a guess, see if you can find it. The big hint here for defending as white, and obviously these players weren't uh, as good as defending as people are now, because computers have shown us, you know, it's, it's easier to defend than you might think. There's always some sort of weird resource. But the big hint is, the threat is knight to g4. So you have to find some way of dealing with that and some way of stopping it. It doesn't look too easy to do, but there's actually this really brilliant move, queen to d8, which maybe would have held this together for white. And 
It's really complicated uh, because now, okay, the obvious point is you have stopped this move because of the uh, because of the pin with the queen. But it becomes an interesting topic of is there a discovery on the queen? Another aspect of this position is can white develop this bishop somewhere on this diagonal and introduce the threat of rook takes queen while simultaneously making some sort of threat against the king. This is kind of the way you want to think about when you're attacking. So for example, even starting with a move like bishop to h3 seems like a very interesting continuation. Um, one of the big plans is, well, my next move might just be to play queen to g4. So a typical attacking pattern is in this position, say they grab the rook, queen to g4 would be threatening mate, where even if they play here, you simply play queen to f3, and mate is going to come very soon. Maybe white can, you know, truck the queen or something, but this is going to just be a, a quick checkmate. However, after uh, bishop to h3, perhaps white can get away with something like queen takes c7, king f8, and it's a real mess. It's not easy to know what's going on. Uh, maybe white should consider taking here. Taking on b7 is also interesting because it, it kind of defends against potential stuff on g2. <laughs> e5 becomes an interesting move for the reason that it's getting out of... Uh, getting out of the way of this diagonal so the queen might be able to take on b7 at some point. There's a lot of interesting moves, so potentially a few ways there for uh, white to have possibly defended in this crazy position, but it's not clear at all uh, what exactly is going on. And in the game, he played the move c3, so the opponent played c3. This is way too slow. It has this idea of playing d4, shutting down the bishop, but you're simply not going to have time. So black here now is totally winning, and he really showed us why. Um, another common defensive move that you might see these days is something a little bit more direct like d4, which, yeah, just chuck a pawn. You, white has to get these pieces into the game or it's just going to be too problematic. So after c3, black continued with the very logical knight to g4. And after h3, how else to defend against the mate, takes on f2, where white can consider giving up a rook. That's obviously going to lose. But in the game, he went to the corner. King to h1. And now, you may want to pause again. What uh, fantastic continuation did Blackburn find here? And it's actually going to lead to what is now famously known as the Blackburn mate. So there's a lot of different mating patterns. One of them that's not too common, it's very rare, is the Blackburn mate. Just to give you guys a little heads up, and it has to do with... Uh, the knight and two bishops. So that's a pretty big hint. The brilliant move he played here was bishop to f5. This reveals an attack on the queen and also introduces the fact that the bishop might be coming to this diagonal, the same diagonal as the white king. So with that in mind, white did grab on a8. And now can you find the best move here? I hope you did not say bishop to e4 because this is not the best move. Yeah, okay, obviously this leads to mate. But it does let white start checking. You can actually be a little bit more forceful with the brilliant move. Queen takes h3. So a brilliant queen sacrifice. You'll notice all of these squares around the king are already uh, taken up by the knight, by the bishop. And after you recapture, you introduce the bishop into the game. And all of these squares are blocked off from the king. So this is, in fact, checkmate. And this is like the original Blackburn mate. Absolutely beautiful. You love this. Sacrificed everything, and the three minor pieces remaining are the ones delivering the checkmate. So I really enjoyed that game, and it really kind of got me inspired to go ahead and check out a few more of the Blackburn games that are out there. And I want to share a couple more with you. This next one is a game he actually played in a 10-board blindfold simul. So he had the white pieces here, and he's playing in a simul blindfolded and he comes up with this absolutely brilliant game so he plays here obviously typical for the the day and age he plays a danish gambit you'd never want to eat the danish don't eat blackburn's danish it's very dangerous and after bishop to c4 the like reputation i think actually is to play c takes b2 but i know even a lot of strong players in modern times are going to be a little bit too scared a little bit wary about taking too many of these pawns here and letting white get a huge initiative and this is just going to be another model game of white getting the pieces out really quickly and black not uh, not able to keep up in development. So in this position, he just simply takes back knight to c6, knight f3, and already we see black play a mistake in this position. Here we saw the move knight to e5, and this is simply too slow. When you look at it, 
yeah, we're down a pawn, but white already has three pieces out, is ready to castle. Black doesn't have any of these pieces out. He only has this one knight. So the development count is massive in uh, white's favor. And, uh, okay, so we see this move, moving the same piece twice. Here is an, uh, a simple tactic too is available now for white. White simply captures this knight and then plays bishop takes f7. These bishop takes f7 tactics are very, very common, and uh, they pop up in all sorts of games when you got that bishop on c4. The idea being, obviously, the king cannot take the bishop or the queen would be hanging. So he has to play this very awkward move, king to e7. So <laughs> this is definitely uh, looking like black might get into a lot of trouble here. Bishop to g5, developing a piece with tempo. Doesn't lose the queen yet because knight to f6, the knight has to enter into a pin. And when I first saw this, I think the most logical continuation to my mind would have been to play a move like queen to b3. White obviously wants to keep the queens on the board and evacuate this square for the queen. However, look what Blackburn came up with. This very, very interesting move. Queen to h5. Uh, <laughs> absolutely stunning. The knight is pinned, so you can't take the queen. But it also kind of introduces this potential threat on the h file. You know, so now maybe if h6, if you ever take this bishop, maybe the rook would be hanging behind it. And it also introduces the fact that maybe at some point, if this bishop moves away, the queen would be able to sneak into the f7 square. So very interesting. Also, of course, getting out of the way for the rook. So white now has a pretty easy time getting all of the stuff in there. It's just a matter of where is the checkmate? How do you eventually hunt down this king and, and deliver a mate? c6 is probably a little bit slow. Uh, it's pretty obvious that black is getting worried here about knight to d5. Whenever you have this pin on the knight, you want to play knight to d5, add another attacker, and attack that pin piece one more time. Probably somehow he's got to get this bishop into the game. Uh, maybe bishop to e6, maybe even bishop to g4 with the idea that if the queen takes, you're removing the defender of f7. Something like this might have been a little bit more accurate for black, because now white simply gets the rook into the game, and after queen to a5, plays another absolutely brilliant move. Uh, another attacking move, how is he gonna get it in? Of course, white maybe could castle, but uh, he notices perhaps this alignment of the queens. And he plays a really interesting move here. So this is an important thing too, when you're looking for tactics and you're looking for resources, it's good to just know the queens are on the same line. The same way we kind of know the bishop is on the same line as the king. You're kind of looking through the pieces and trying to see what is aligned where. So here, for example, after the move f4, just opening more files, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to open more files. If black were to take this pawn now, he would simply be losing a queen after this check. So this alignment actually does matter and is preventing a move like pawn takes f4. So black tries this move, queen to c5. Uh, okay, moving the queen again, preventing white from castling, but it's not that big of a deal. White simply wants to open the position up attacking that knight, forcing the queen to move away, and now he gets castled. So yeah, white really has everything here, but after h6, it is time to look around and try to see if we can checkmate that king. White has all the pieces in. The knight's looking good, the rooks are looking good, the bishops are great, the queen is looking good, but how are we going to knock him out? In this position, he found the move bishop to e8, introducing this idea now of bringing the queen in for a checkmate on f7, and black plays what is basically the only defensive try, bishop to e6, needs to be able to cover this square. And here is another time where it's it's worth uh, spending a little bit of time. There's at least two really good ways of knocking out black here. And uh, you can pause the video and see if you can find it and come up with what Blackburn came up here within the game. Uh, it has all to do, there's so many pins, there's so many removing the defenders. It obviously has to do with the fact that this is almost checkmate except for the bishop that would be covering it. And this is almost checkmate except for the bishop. So this piece could be overworked. And yeah, he's just able to here remove some of the defenders and start a king hunt. And rook to d7 does win, as does the move that he played. His move is great, uh, at least visually. Rook takes f6 was his choice, not the only move, uh, but... Yeah, a truly beautiful one. And now after pawn takes, he came up with this move, rook to d7, which is just an awesome move. The king is going to have to go on a hunt. You're going to have to move the bishop out of the way. Queen comes into f7. 
uh, after king to d6, the queen takes on d7, and the king hunt begins. And when you're hunting down this king, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to not let him escape at all. Um, so, yeah, he begins with bishop to e3, taking away the squares on this diagonal. The knight's doing a good job forcing the king to come as close to white as possible. Queen takes b7, king to a5, and in his notes, he does say that he announced mate in three moves here. I think that was the uh, the custom of the day. People used to <laughs> just declare mate in three. Uh, and yeah, blindfolded, playing nine other people, he was able to uh, to make this announcement. So the game presumably ended here. But it is mate in three. Go ahead and pause if you do want to find it. It's very nice, and I don't think it's necessarily super obvious how to do it. So a lot of people might really struggle with this mate in three. A lot of roads lead to the win here, but the mate in three begins with this brilliant move, b4, which has the idea of distracting this bishop. The bishop is actually useful here because it's blocking an escape square for the king. So we'll notice, if you look around the king, there's not a lot of squares that it can possibly go to, so mate should be right around the corner. The second move of the pattern is bishop to b6, giving up another bishop, but now notice how... The uh, A file has now opened up, so you take the rook, and now it's checkmate. The knight does a good job, the queen delivers the mate, and uh, yeah, the bishop is useful in that it's blocking in the retreating square. So I really liked that game, and it really shows how strong of a player he was, uh, able to come up with something this beautiful and this attacking, aggressive style in simuls and in blindfold exhibitions. The last game uh, is against somebody that actually had a name... <laughs> Leverson is the only name that uh, I know for this player. have no idea who that is. A last name is not given, but one step up from no name. Uh, Blackburn actually had success against a lot of other strong players like Steinitz and uh, other strong players of the time. But uh, I just like these <laughs> these games that he, he beat up on some Patzers, so maybe that's unfair. But to my mind, these games are all still very impressive. And this game was a slightly different opening. Okay, we see something nice and respectable. But it's an Evans Gambit. Uh, I think this is an awesome way for White to play. He plays an Evans Gambit. If you got the Urasov Gambit in your repertoire, if you got the Nackvinson Gambit in your repertoire, tossing in the Evans Gambit is also a, uh, a very good way to just round out that entire repertoire. So I'm always fascinated by Evans Gambits, with which a lot of good players, you know, Fisher, Gary Kasparov, have tried playing these. Um, and after C3, Bishop C5 was the move played. There's quite a lot of moves for Black here. Um, he castled right away. D4 is a little bit more popular now. But after D6, D4, we saw this capture here. Knight to B6, and white develops to C3. And again, we see an example. White is sacrificed a pawn, but he is ahead in development. Uh, black plays this move, knight to A5, which is actually correct in this exact position. And in a lot of these Evans Gambits, black is going to make this move. However... Yeah, this is kind of like, you can say, see again, somebody's moving the same piece twice in the opening. Here it's correct, but it always does mean white is going to get some sort of initiative. And uh, he plays a very interesting move here, uh, bishop to g5. And a lot of this is based on a tactic. Uh, I think at first sight, it might look like perhaps white has blundered, right? Because f6, now there's two bishops attacked. But there actually is a little bit of tactic, uh, there's a tactical resource available to white in these kinds of positions, where if this bishop just moved away and you captured, you're actually not losing a piece because of this useful check, queen to uh, a4, and on the next turn you'll pick up this knight. So a nice little tactic to know about, especially if you play this opening, but it does pop up all the time. Instead, knight to e7 was played, okay, developing a piece, how bad can it be? And now comes knight to d5. So the interesting moment now occurs after uh, the pawn goes to f6. And you may want to pause here, see if you can find the attacking continuation. He went in for the move. Bishop takes f6. And you can kind of tell after this recapture, the knight joins the attack. It's very interesting. Notice how... The knight is doing just kind of an awesome job keeping the, the king from running this way. Bishop's doing an awesome job. So we're forcing that king to f8. And the question is how to continue the attack. Well, he just played the move knight to g5. Just totally ignoring the bishop on c4. And introducing the idea that this queen is going to come in. Maybe to f3, maybe to h5. It's going to come to one of these squares. And uh, that black king doesn't have a lot of pieces around him. 
black did grab and maybe queen h5 is just as good as queen to f3 uh he went with queen to f3 certainly looks scary it doesn't seem obvious to me how black should defend and one of the beautiful things here is that wherever this this knight moves it uh actually has a good chance of being a double check which are gonna be really powerful because then the king will have to move uh uh, I mean, okay, I guess black can maybe defend with a move like c6, which actually in the ensuing king hunt will give the c7 square for a king. Uh, and maybe black could have put one of the pieces here on f5, trying to give a piece back to block this file. In the game, black got a little bit greedy with knight to d2, and this is actually the losing move. You can now kind of pause at every turn here and try to see if you can play like Blackburn. Played really impressive here. Uh, very good at calculating these long king hunts, and uh, there's a few little accuracies along the way that I want to point out when we get there. Uh, here, he goes with knight takes h7. Beautiful move, a good start to this hunt. Queen to f7, very logical, forcing this king to uh, go for a run. Knight to f6, forcing that king out, and again, we have a situation where the king is on the run. It's only a matter of time for white to figure it out. But here is actually the hardest challenge of this whole game. Uh, see if you can find what white played here. So far, it's been very logical, but how do you continue? There's only one winning move for white, and maybe it's not that easy. So do pause here, see if you can find it, because uh, I think this is one of the, the most beautiful moves of this whole game, and already it's been, been a pretty nice one. In this position, it's actually all about keeping this king from running away. So in this position, he played rook a to b1. Absolutely beautiful, not letting the king run away. And now, if you grab on b1, which didn't happen in the game, the idea is queen to c4, and we can already tell black is going to start running out of moves. All you can do here is really block, but as soon as this rook gets into the game, it's going to be a, a pretty quick checkmate here. Yeah, maybe you can block with some, some bishop or something. But uh, very, very nice. In the game, what actually happened uh, was this move. Bishop takes d5. White followed it up with bringing another rook in. So now he's just simply attacking with way too many pieces. The king can't run away. And after bishop to c5, hopefully you can spot the checkmate. <laughs> the checkmate begins with... Queen to d5, a nice little queen sacrifice to polish off the game. And after the knight takes, we take back with the d-pawn. King still can't run away. He's in check. The pawn is delivering the mate. This rook b1, beautiful move, is not letting this king run away. Uh, and I don't know. Yeah, I just saw, started watching some of these games. I've, uh, I'm starting to take an interest here in Blackburn. Really underestimated, in my opinion. Really played a lot of beautiful attacking games. This was only a little sample just to get you guys interested in it. Uh, let me know what you think. Let me know if there's any other chess players you'd like to see a video about that played some beautiful games. Maybe we can, uh, in the future, pick some other players. I kind of like this format. We look at some players. We look at some of their, their best games. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comment below. And uh, as always, hit that like, hit share, make a lot of comments. I really do appreciate them. And we'll see you next time when we cover another chess classic.